my paper will actually pick up on um, some of the same themes of Alan's paper in a, in a rather different context, looking at issues of human environment interactions and of the balancing needs of human beings and the realities of environmental constraint. And deforestation, too, I'd say, is part of my story. But in, in this paper, I want to discuss more specifically some of the kinds of consequences of deforestation, especially over a long historical term, and particularly the consequences for agriculturalists. Um, as Alan noted, the destruction of watersheds and the consequent erosion of sediments um, creates serious problems. And as we'll see in the paper that uh, in my short presentation today, this, uh, one of the consequences of large-scale erosion is the siltation of, of reservoirs. So with that, I have a lot of clicking. I hope I can. Okay, let's begin with a kind of what I think of a curious paradox uh, moving west to, to India. And that is that in contemporary India, um, perhaps second only to China, is often seen as being one of the most active dam-building countries on Earth. And yet, on the other hand, India is also the home to some of the most well-organized um, and most um, media-savvy, we might say, anti-dam movements. And this, this paradox is particularly acute when you think about the fact that India, of course, is a democratic country. Um, and the response of a large portion of its citizenship to the development of large dam projects presumably would be something of particular interest to the government. So for example, I'm not gonna talk about this project in any great detail. Um, the Sardar Sarvar project, which many of you may have heard of, is based on the Narmada River in Western India, mostly in the states of Gujarat, uh, but, but including three, two other states as well. Um, the Narmada project um, will um, displace what is completed, consists of a number of dams, and will displace something like over 1.5 million people from their homes through the inundation of the dam waters. There have been tremendous um, protests against the Sardar Sarovar construction, and there have been um, a number of court actions, and, and work has stopped a couple of times, but basically the, the project is, is ongoing. Right? So uh, with, with, I would say, international support intermittently. Some, some of the protests against the Sardar Sarovar project, I don't have time to get into any of the particular details, um, the most well-known organization is an organization called uh, Narmada Bato Andalan, the Save the Narmada Movement. They're um, led, you can see their leader, Meda Patkar, here in the upper left-hand image. They're very effectively, or I say somewhat effectively, because they're still not able to stop the project, deploying a lot of the same kinds of strategies of protest against the Indian government that were used so effectively to gain India's independence in the first place from the British whole variety of kinds of maneuvers, including you know, very um, astute use of the media, court challenges, a fast unto death, you can see here, uh, various kinds of sit-ins on the lower right, um, and so on. Uh, at the same time, however, it's certainly the case, and this is also a kind of a paradox that I'll be thinking about a little bit today, it's certainly the case that contemporary India has a very acute need for power and for irrigation resources for agriculture, particularly as India pop population grows and as the um, standard of living of many Indians is improving, people are there are demanding irrigation uh, water and also um, uh, energy resources of, of a level, nothing like approaching the level that we enjoy, but something a little more, right? So we have a kind of a conflict built in. Okay. So I have three simple points today. And that is, first of all, I wanna talk about the critiques of large dam projects. Uh, critiques that are, of course, not specific to the South Asian context, but could be leveled against a lot of these massive projects in North America and Asia and anywhere. Um, and to point out that there are certainly legitimate and human rights and environmental critiques of large dam projects. And I will um, go through these rather quickly. On the other hand, and the point I want to make specifically today is that many of the kinds of visions of alternatives, that is, of people who are protesting against large dam projects, the, the alternative visions are very often based on a problematic romantic vision of traditional agriculture. And I'll say it here that you know, my own discipline in anthropology and I'm specifically in archaeology have been involved in looking at long-term historical trajectories of agriculture and environmental change. So, whoops. Click the wrong 
My point then, my third and final point then, is I think that analysis of the long-term histories of agricultural success and failure can help us to craft some solutions to contemporary problems. So these are the three basic points that I hope to make today. Okay, so let me just give you a kind of sense of where we're going with this short presentation. And that is, first I'm going to go run through some of the specific um, critiques, human rights, and in e ecological critiques that have been levied against these massive irrigation projects. And I'll make the point that the problems of these kinds of facilities are in fact not unique to the present. That the kinds of both environmental and human problems that we see of large dams, it's not something that was invented in the 20th or 21st century, but it's a problem that we've had to dealt with, we as a species, you know, for a very long time indeed. And secondly, I'll very briefly talk a little bit about some of the kinds of visions of what constitutes sustainable alternatives to the development of large dam projects. Uh, and argue that what we need, at least now, is a kind of more um, realistic sense of traditional facilities and their relative successes and failures. And in order to resolve this dilemma, I think, and I, I hope this will pick up some of the themes of the previous papers, that we need understanding, I would say, of both ecological and cultural context. So there are both very large scale kinds of questions at stake here, uh, problems that we could take to you know, North America, Latin America, anywhere else. On the other hand, both the environmental and the cultural context are very specific to the particular locations, and those also need to be attended to. So let's think for a minute, just briefly then, about some of the kinds of critiques that have been leveled against um, large dam projects. Um, first of all, there are a whole series of environmental effects that are created when, particularly when rivers are dammed up to create very large bodies of water. And one of these is the submergence of forests and the loss, and, uh, and the loss of biodiversity and forests and other kinds of ecosystems that are covered up with sheets of water. Um, secondly, a serious problem, as we'll see, is the problem of siltation behind the dam. This can lead to um, the loss of fertile sediments that are carried in the water ordinarily that are now being stuck behind these large dams and the, the sediment rich uh, waters uh, no longer are available downstream. The siltation of dams and reservoirs leads to the loss of capacity, so there's, no more, there's not enough room for the water anymore. Um, curiously enough, actually, it can lead to exacerbation of erosion processes downstream and, uh, and to the things like the block passage for migratory animals, something that we're very well aware of, I think, in the North American context with problems of salmon and other kinds of anadromous fish. Finally, um, there are, uh, particularly for very large projects, microenvironmental effects on climate that are created by you know, changing vegetation regimes and creating these large sheets of water. Okay, we've got a couple of more environmental effects. Water pollution can be a problem um, the creation of algal blooms, and particularly with the use of chemical pesticides associated with the extension of irrigated agriculture, especially irrigated agriculture for large scale commercial production. Some of these large uh, bodies of water, which are often located in semi arid environments that never had large bodies of surface water before, have proved to be very attractive environments for invasive um, plant and animal species. Um, and, and Thirdly, and I think, you know, perhaps in a sense most um, tellingly for advocates of large projects, some of these, uh, many large dam projects actually lead to water logging of the command area. The command area is the area underneath the dam which is meant to be irrigated or watered. And I, and I should say perhaps that, you know, there, are, in general there are three kinds of impulses for the constructions of these dams. One is the um, providing hydroelectric power. The second, and in South Asia, probably most important impulse is for the uh, extension of irrigation to agriculture. And the third impulse, which was a little bit more well developed in South Asia in the colonial context is, or what are often referred to as protective works. That is the idea that the dam is going to prevent annual flooding and um, protect the landscape around it. However, water logging of the command area is a consistent problem of large scale and, as we'll see, small scale uh, ponded irrigation. And that water logging, there's a water log field on the lower right, I hope you can see that it's a little dark. Uh, water logging, of course, leads to a decrease in agricultural productivity. And if the primary goal of the uh, reservoir is to promote increase in agricultural productivity, you can see that this could be a little bit of a problem. Salinization related to water logging, of course, 
again, is a similar kind of problem. So this is, in a, a nutshell, um, a, a kind of a, a, a checklist, you might say, of some of the kinds of ecological effects um, that are associated with these dam projects and that have been very widely discussed in the in literature, particularly in the environmental literature. Okay, but the human consequences of these projects, of course, are no less dire. Um, and these include uh, most dramatically, I'd say, the, the loss of, uh, of, of land that's caused by inundation. That's when the water comes in and um, uh, people are displaced from their agricultural fields. They lose rights to agricultural land, very often grazing land, because the, the land which is uh, inundated very often does not have some kind of clear title to it. But they, these are lands that people use for gathering of firewood and other kinds of informal uh, economic activities, so they're not compensated in any way whatsoever. All right, um, Villages, of course, homes, sacred places are covered with water. You can see some temples on the upper right um, as one of these Narmada project uh, reservoirs slowly fills up. We can see the temples uh, going slowly underneath the water. And of course, um, resettlement schemes to move the sometimes millions and millions and millions of people who are displaced by these projects are very often, and particularly in the Indian case, very often problematic. Um, there's a typically migration to cities, and um, when people are compensated with agricultural land, it's very often not of the quality that they had before. Finally, and this is my last point on the sort of human consequences or the human costs, you might say, of these large construction, is that almost invariably, no matter what the impulse behind it, the water distribution tends to be unequal. So that benefits, in generally, those who already have certain kinds of political power and clout and disadvantages other. And again, almost uh, inevitably, it seems, um, there is extension of commercial production, particularly commercial production of water-loving, water-intensive kinds of crops like sugarcane, like rice. And this leads to loss of subsistence independence. So instead of growing subsistence crops, uh, people are growing, uh, a few people who have access to the water and access to the irrigated land are growing these labor intensive, water intensive kinds of crops and the regional economy is ir you know, irradicably, uh, irrevocably changed. The third line of critique, and this is the last one, that have been leveled, levied against large dams. I like this mosquito because it's really quite a terrifying <laughs> looking mosquito. <laughs> Having myself actually caught dengue fever last year in India, uh, which is a mosquito-borne disease uh, that was very, very rare in South Asia until quite recently, actually. So the uh, malaria, of course, a much better known mosquito-borne disease, but the habitat of mosquitoes, a, a great vector of um, certain kinds of diseases, is greatly extended by the expansion of these kinds of um, large pools of still water. So there are serious kinds of disease implications associated with these large bodies of water. And then secondly, um, and I, I could put this either in the human side or the public safety side here, is the danger of catastrophic dam failure. That is, when the reservoir, when the dam breaches, as many of them will, I mean, the, the human consequences are tremendous, of course. Villages and towns are washed away, people are killed. And there are two factors that are particularly worrying, I would say, in that case, when we think about the South Asian context. One is the rampant cor corruption in construction so that substandard building materials and so on is very well documented or often used in the construction of these large dams. For those people who live right underneath the dam, it's a little something to worry about particularly. And also the uh, excessive siltation that's been um, very well documented that leads to loss of capacity and it changes the uh, flow characteristics of water going into the reservoir and much more likely to lead to uh, you know, major breaches of the reservoir. Okay. So, I'll, I'll say in a minute um, something more about this. Okay, so, so this is the kind of, in a nutshell, the critique. You might say the anti-dam kind of environmentalist position. And I, and I, I hope that I, I made the point in the initial outline that many of these critiques, I think, are really you know, right on and that there are serious problems. Right? But what's the alternative? Right? One of the kinds of positions that we often see in the uh, environmentalist literature, uh, and particularly in the, among anti-dam activists in South Asia and elsewhere, is a position that some scholars have turned the new traditionalist position. And the new traditionalist position has a number of postulates. So let's just go through these quickly. One is that traditional irrigation 
was sustainable and non-exploitative. Of course, this is in contrast to the sort of rather you know, sinister view that I've just sketched out uh, a minute ago, that traditional agricultural facilities are small scale, that they work well, that they represent a kind of lost cultural wisdom that we in the West or westernized people would do well to return to. Furthermore, there's a consistent notion that traditional facilities were community managed, that they were not associated with power or exploitation in any kind of way, and that the loss of traditional facilities was due to some kind of external interference. In, in, the, in places that um, have a colonial past, it's almost invariably the colonizers who are blamed for this, but as we'll see, the colonizers too had a story, as did their predecessors. Okay. So secondly, then the major sort of second um, principle of the new traditionalist position is that the kind of cultural logic of traditional irrigation is fundamentally different from that of contemporary projects. That is, that there's a kind of Western modern notion of irrigation and agriculture and power generation, and, and that there's a kind of indigenous traditional position, and that these are radically different, and that there can be no accord. Right. In the specific context of India, then, this is very often cast in terms of a kind of conventionalized opposition between the Gandhian and the Nehruvian. Right? Gandhi, I think we all know who that was, right? Nehru, for those of you who are not you know, South Asianists or uh, fashion, fashionistas, Nehru was the first prime minister of independent India and was very well known for his advocacy of contemporary science and he was the um, supporter of the construction of many large dam projects in newly independent India. That was 1947 and 1950s. But the point I want to make, I guess, is that the, this distinction between the Nehruvian and the Gandhian, or between the indigenous um, and the foreign, or the modern and the traditional, is a distinction which is very much overdrawn on the one hand. And secondly, it's a distinction which misses entirely the actual histories of South Asian agriculture and politics and religion, let's say. Okay, so there, unfortunately, I'm not going to give you an easy answer at the end. Okay, so my question is, so what, what exactly can an historical perspective contribute to this debate? Is there anything that we uh, archaeologists, for example, can say that can help us to understand the contemporary situation? Obviously, I wouldn't stand up here and say all this if I didn't think there was, but let me just say in a, in a very briefly what it is I think we can say. That is, first of all, what we have done, and, I'll, uh, and here I, I don't mean we as a discipline, but we as my research team over the last 20-something years, have done is very detailed, very close study of actual uh, agricultural landscapes over a long period of time. And so we've been able to reconstruct the history of reservoirs on the landscape for actually the past several thousand years. And so we have a very good idea, in a sense, of what has worked and what has not, and how it's been integrated into human political and cultural world. We know uh, quite a bit for these early periods about the context of patronage and construction. And if, if politics were important for understanding, the, if politics are important for understanding the present, they're certainly also important for understanding the past. Um, and we were, were able to discuss, although I don't have time to talk about this in great detail, how these kinds of facilities, even 600 years ago, were financed, the kinds of ritual associations that they have, and the way in which, for example, labor was mobilized to build them, repair them, and so on. Okay, so that's a, we have the historical, you might say, the political. And then finally, we have the paleoenvironmental. So the project that I'm going to talk about, I'm not really going to explain to you how we did it, although I'm happy to do that in the question and answer. But it includes historical data, archaeological analysis, and paleoenvironmental analysis, reconstruction of vegetation histories and fire histories. And what we can understand from, and, and sediment, uh, from the history of vegetation, history of erosion, is the very complex history that this region has seen of both deforestation and afforestation. And we've documented in some detail patterns of hillside erosion and valley floor siltation. So that just give you a sense of what the historical material uh, will do. And I think so what we have then in a nutshell is actual uh, historical evidence for how human environmental factors have worked together over time in real world situations, which I think is a kind of Ba baseline of data, which ought to be very helpful in, in uh, uh, resolving contemporary problems. Okay, so let's move back in time a little bit, and all of these pictures I'm giving you 
are of reservoirs um, that were built in the 14th, 15th, or 16th century. It's a 16th century reservoir, very, very big. So I'm not talking about just little puddles. I mean, these are quite, quite substantial bodies of water. Um, between about 500 and 1600 in AD, in southern India particularly, and also in Sri Lanka, is something that we could certainly think of as the birth of the traditional system. If you're thinking about the arguments of what the people have called the new traditionalist, when they argue about how the traditional system worked, it is in fact this traditional system that we've been studying. And what we see archeologically, just to give you an overview, is that very sophisticated technologies of irrigation have been in use in India for more than a thousand years but that ancient reservoirs come in a wide range of sizes, from very small ones, which of course I don't you know, usually put slides up as much because they don't look as good, um, but very large ones. And very, very large facilities were already being built by about the eighth century in southern India. And these facilities would certainly be classified by modern irrigation engineers as large reservoirs. All right? So again, these are the kinds of, they're, they're absolutely commensurate kinds of uh, facilities that we're talking about. All right, what have, what have we learned then? Let me just say, um, give you a kind of a summary of what we've learned about the life history of reservoirs in, in the South Indian landscape. Here you can see on the right, two deeply silted sluice gates. This, both of them are in places that would once have had water all around them. Um, you can see the kind of dam behind the upper one, that's the rock. So they're earthen dams faced with masonry that collected either uh, water seasonal streams or uh, winter, uh, summer monsoon runoff. And there were tunnels underneath the embankment that took water from the reservoir and distributed to the fields below. So we control the water in these tunnels by basically like a bathtub. You just put a plug in and pull the plug out and the water would flow through the tunnels. To get to the drain, the bath drain, right, there's a sluice gate and the sluice gate has the opening to the tunnel. In this area, the sluices are very elaborately do, uh, or, uh, ornamented uh, in ways that um, are very similar to temple architecture. So we can see that these two sluice gates are actually quite deeply silted. The one on the, on the top certainly has at least three meters of siltation. That's, that's quite a bit. Um, and it's, it's so silted in that it, it's no longer functional. Okay. So what we see then overall from our large scale and long term study of, of South Asian reservoirs is first of all at the very high rate of failure, that is in terms of productivity. In so, uh, it's an area in central southern India's area, very low rainfall, and in many years the reservoirs do not fill up at all. They have very high evaporation rates because the water is quite spread out and not terribly deep. Um, and they also have high siltation rates, as you can see from the photos. And this is very clearly uh, correlated with deforestation in the, in the catchment of the reservoir. Secondly, reservoirs have a very high rate of failure in terms of stability. That is, there's a, a tremendous incidence of dam breaching. Virtually every reservoir that we've studied has been broken and patched and broken and patched, and most of them eventually broke and were abandoned entirely. So the danger of catastrophic dam failure is not a problem you know, that we need to worry about only today. It was a problem people in the past also worried about. And we have very good historical and, in some cases, archaeological evidence of entire villages being washed away by dam breaches. So, and, and again, both epigraphic and archeological evidence of constant maintenance of these facilities. Thirdly, we found that reservoirs, and particularly uh, reservoirs fed by canals, were very congenial environments for disease vectors. Think of that terrifying you know, monster mosquito again. We historically, in the area where there was perennial irrigation in our study area, People, in fact, did not live anywhere near the fields because the risk of malaria was much too high and they lived far away and only went to the fields during the day. Okay, the human costs of reservoirs, too, in the uh, pre-colonial period were quite significant. So remember this period I'm talking about, about 500, about 1600 AD. There you can see a large 16th century temple on the upper right. Temples were very closely associated with agricultural production. For these early dams, not surprisingly, inundation uh, was a serious problem. That is, when the dam was constructed and a large pool of water developed, people were displaced from their fields, from their homes, from their grazing land, and also something that we don't think about so much now, but that roads and transportation routes were significantly affected. What we've been able to document archaeologically, historically, and paleoenvironmentally too, is that areas with more secure and reliable irrigation mostly shifted over to cash crops and commercial production. So the same kinds of problems that we see in the contemporary world are problems that we also saw 
um, in this same context. The distribution of water was rarely equable, and the construction and maintenance of reservoirs was very political, a very highly politicized, even for small facilities. Um, and there were various kinds of um, political machinations and tax implications and so on um, that we don't need to worry about. Um, but in any case, I hope you're starting to see here that there are the kinds of critiques that have been leveled against the large projects are, in, in perhaps slightly smaller scale, also problems that we can see against the long-term historical record of reservoirs and other kinds of irrigation facilities in southern India. Okay. But actually, I have only one slide for the colonial period because I knew I had to cut this way, way back. But I will say a very interesting thing. The term tank actually comes from the British. We usually say tank in India, even though reservoir is a much more accurate kind of term. But, um, the, and of course, once the colonial period begins, we have much more ample historical documentation. And I've been working with this material. And what we find is the, pat the general pattern of low productivity and failure of reservoirs, particularly in the dry zones of southern India and Sri Lanka, continues throughout the colonial period. And it's an object of much complaining in the historical documents. But very uh, wonderfully, I think, amazingly, is that the particular kind of rhetoric of a golden age when all the tanks, all the reservoirs were in use at once, a lot of them are abandoned now, and when they were in better repair is something that we find in the colonial documents. And I didn't really have time to discuss this in great deal, but the kind of, you know, uh, uh, sort of golden age thinking where, you know, things were much better when we were all younger, kids these days, you know, don't respect their elders, and so on. I mean, everything has really gone to hell. That kind of argumentation we see very clearly in middle period South Asia, this pre-colonial South Asia. The British, too, engaged in this kind of, you know, moaning about the golden age of tanks. Um, and they, of course, blamed the defeated rulers, the ones they defeated, for letting the system decline, okay? But this is, again, exactly parallel to the kind of new traditionalist discourse um, that we see today. So my suggestion then is that the new traditionalist discourse, whether it's 16th century, 17th, 18th, 19th, or 21st century, sets up these very uh, problematic dichotomies and I think also pits uh, people like archaeologists, anthropologists, engineers, and development specialists against each other in ways which are probably not that productive, suggesting that there are these kinds of straightforward contrasts between modern projects and ancient projects. But as we've seen, the ancient projects themselves were highly politicized, had some serious human rights and environmental consequences, and um, were not in any way immune from the kinds of problems that we face today, which is not to say that there are no problems today. So then, just to recap, uh, the, uh, my suggestion here, we have a 15th century reservoir now abandoned. You can see a, a person standing up at the top of the dam there to the left is where the water would have been. And in fact, I would point out these hills uh, be behind, uh, behind the valley here. These hills were originally, we know, uh, heavily forested. They were defor radically deforested in the 16th century, which led to massive uh, movement of silts down in and really the abandonment of an entire system of interconnected chains of reservoirs. The forest came back in the 17th century and then are, have only recently, actually, in the last 50 years or so, been under attack again. And this is an area that's very rich in iron and manganese ore. So you can see all the kinds of, if you're sitting in the front row anyway, you can see, just take my word for it, there are all these kinds of um, gashes in the hills caused by mining and actually has intensified tremendously in the last five years or so because of the demand for iron ore for the construction of the Beijing Olympic Games. So we can see then that both modern and traditional tanks um, face many of the same kinds of problems, environmental problems. They're, they're deeply associated with resource inequity, even very small scale facilities. It wasn't all happy in the past. And very high rates of failure. Okay. I think then finally, here we have the Indian, previous Indian finance minister shaking hands with um, the head of the World Bank uh, at that time. Uh, a modern dam uh, in my study area in, uh, built in the 1940s, 50s on the lower left and a, a 15th century dam on the top. So you see that romantic images of traditional irrigation, I say, did really detract from legitimate critique of modern projects. That is to say, the, the, the problems that I outlined at the beginning of the talk, I think, are very real, very serious problems. But they're not solved by suggesting that we need to return to a kind of mythical past 
in which everything was equable, the environment was better, and everyone lived happily together. Um, I would say, on the other hand, that long-term historical and ecological analysis can really lay a foundation for the realistic assessment of reservoir regeneration programs, because that's one of the important kinds of initiatives that's being taken by many NGOs now, is the restoration of these traditional reservoirs, which I think is not all bad at all, but we need to be quite realistic about which ones are likely to work and which ones are. And finally, uh, the opening of a new dam, and he said, dams are the temples of India where I worship. He really got a lot of flack for that. Right. Um, with a kind of argument that Nehru, he said that about laboratories too, I should point out. So he, he as a kind of you know, worship of Western modernist science um, that misapprehended the indigenous sort of South Asian understanding um, uh, of itself. I think that that actually, that, that interpretation of Nehru's comment forgets about the long history of South Asian political leaders' engagement, particularly with reservoirs, in which reservoirs are highly politicized and they're highly ritualized in you know, ways that I, I wasn't able to discuss here. So I think that the kinds of rhetorics that we see in the development world today and in the world of environmentalists is a very complex rhetoric. And in the case of South Asia, it's one that's both you know, international and global and also specifically South Asian. Um, in its own kind of way. So let me just leave it with that.